Hi YouTubers, thrill seekers, adrenaline junkies, durable small hamsters, unwanted pets, and relatives. It's Mr. Palumbo. Today we're going to talk about the Great War. And everybody knows which war I'm talking about when I talk about the Great War, right? Right? No, we're not talking about the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, the French-Indian War, also known as the Seven Years' War if you're in Europe, or World War II. We are talking about the Great War, World War I. And coming along with us today is a very powerful and famous and successful motivational speaker, somebody who is known for his kindness and his goodness and uh, his love for humanity, uh, please welcome Skeletor. <laughs> I put my heart and soul into making these videos. They take a lot of work and it's a little intimidating sometimes, so I've invited Skeletor uh, to help encourage me through this video uh, and make sure that I'm giving you the best possible quality video which has the best information. I think he's going to do a good job. I could write a book about what you don't know. So we are going to talk about three main components of World War I. First we're going to talk about the causes of the war and I have a really cool acronym for you to remember which will help you with remembering that. And we're also going to talk about uh, major weapons used in the war, weapons and technology. And then we'll talk about the psychological uh, impact of World War I and how even to this day uh, the Great War still affects uh, Europe and um, the way we view things like nationalism and patriotism and the glories of war. So let's get started. All right, well, let's get into the causes of World War I. Uh, like many things in history, it wasn't just one thing. It was multi-layered, multi-dimensional, and uh, kind of chaotic. And then when you look back on it, we study it and say, oh, well, this happened, this happened. Uh, but like most things in history, it wasn't just one thing. Uh, it was many things. But what's an easy way to remember the causes of World War I? Well, there's this acronym called MANIA. And I really wish I would have, I could claim credit for this, uh, but I found it on the internet, so whoever actually came up with it, kudos to you. MANIA means mental illness marked by periods of great excitement, euphoria, delusions, and overactivity. Well, boy, if that doesn't uh, describe World War I, I don't know what does. And the second definition is an excessive enthusiasm or a desire or an obsession. Basically, you're crazy. And we all know that war, if it's not anything else, it's crazy. I would like to call it mustache mania, personally. Because, boy, these guys were sporting some major facial hair. Some awesome facial hair. I think we should call it mustache mania, but it's up to you. And what was our president, Woodrow Wilson? Did he have any facial hair? No. Now, I don't really like this guy because of his progressive ideology. But, come on, man, no mustache, soul patch, nothing? Epic fail. So what is mania and how does it bring together the causes of World War I? Well, the M is militarism. The A is alliances. The N is nationalism. The I is imperialism. And finally, the other A is assassination. So let's look at all these in more detail. Militarism. 
Well, pretty much the word can be broken down. Anytime you see the suffix ism, it is a belief in. So military ism is the belief in military. But uh, basically it's the principle or belief that a nation should build, support, and maintain a large military. You, all, you also foster a strong militaristic spirit. There's also a very aggressive um, attitude towards using your military for bo both offensive and defensive purposes. So let's look at the next one, alliances. Well, an alliance is a pact or agreement or a coalition among two or more nations. After Germany unified to protect itself from France, it made an alliance with its uh, ethnic cousin, Austria-Hungary, and it also made an alliance with Italy. But Italy never really has any major role in World War I or World War II. So this is the probably the last time you'll hear me talk about Italy. Well, because of this alliance... Russia got scared, and it made an alliance with France. And so it begins. All these alliances begin to be uh, made and developed. Well, let's talk about N-nationalism. Nationalism is basically an extreme form of patriotism. You know, to be a patriot, you love your country, you're proud of your country. Uh, to be a nationalist, you believe that not only is your country great, but is far superior than all other countries. There's a very uh, racist, bigoted overtone to it, but it's an easy way to get people behind you uh, to support a common cause. Uh, things like brotherhood and uh, traditions and culture. If your country shares all those things, you can whip people up in a nationalistic spirit and get them to uh, buy into whatever you're trying to do. Imperialism. Imperialism is a policy or practice by which a state gains more power and resources by controlling other foreign nations or ethnic areas. This has been going on for hundreds of years. Rome did this kind of thing. Europe is definitely into this kind of thing. Uh, by the time we turn to the 20th century, it's going to start. Uh, we've already reached the pinnacle of imperialism, if you will. But uh, here in 1914, it's still uh, commonplace and uh, destructive. Imperialism, its biggest uh, component is colonies. So the mother country sets up colonies, and it uses those colonies to create a favorable trade. Uh, it's also a way to collect taxes. And again, favorable trade uh, with the mother country. If you think of the American colonies, uh, the mother country was Britain, and the colonies had to trade with Britain, and they would often get cheap prices for their raw materials, and then they would in turn have to pay expensive prices for British goods. And finally, A, assassination. And this is where we're going to see the other components of our mania come together. In late June of 1914, Archduke Franz Ferdinand was shot by a Serbian radical while on a visit to Sarajevo. He was actually down there inspecting military troops. There's our militarism. He's in Sarajevo, which is a... It's not a colony, but it's a foreign country controlled 
by Austria-Hungary. So there is the imperialism. The Serbian national who assassinates Franz Ferdinand and his wife was a nationalist. So there's the end, the nationalist. Uh, Serbia was in Bosnia. It's not, a, it's not one of these, uh, it's not an Austria-Hungarian country. It's kind of just they, they took it over. It's actually an area of many different ethnic groups, mostly Slavic, which that'll come up in a second. Uh, so anyway, he gets, he gets assassinated in Sarajevo. Because of this, Austria-Hungary declares war on Serbia. And since Serbia is predominantly Slavic, Russia mobilizes, because Russia is also Slavic, and Germany declares war on them. And basically, World War I officially begins. Let's look at a chain of events to try to help us see how all the components of Armenia came together and started World War I. So if you look at this, Franz Ferdinand was assassinated. Germany grants Austria-Hungary a blank check to punish Serbia. Basically, uh, Germany tells Austria-Hungary, do whatever you want. We're, we're behind you 100%. Serbia pretty much... Even though Serbia tries to uh, agree to the ultimatum of Austria-Hungary, Austria-Hungary still uh, declares war on them. And because they declare a war on a small Slavic country, Russia feels like, you know, you're picking on my smaller cousin. And because Russia mobilizes, Germany declares war on them. And so it begins. So let's look at the powers involved. There's basically like a boxing match. There's two, there's two opponents, the central powers and the allied powers. The central powers were Germany, Austria-Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire. But by the time the war dragged on, Germany was the war machine. Germany was the major player compared to the other two. Then you have the Allied Powers, which was made up of France, Russia, Great Britain, and eventually the United States. Again, even though this is kind of a U.S. history course, it's mostly a world history course, because the U.S. really doesn't come in until very late, and as you'll find out later, many Americans even kind of regretted getting involved. So here we are, and this is what it looks like at the beginning of the war. One of the main characteristics of World War I is the appearance of trench warfare. According to Britannica.com, trench warfare occurs when the defensive force's firepower is superior, causing the opposing force to take cover. Because military technology often advances faster than military tactics. This caused the war to be a giant stalemate. You can also see this phenomena again at the end of the American Civil War where firepower was superior to tactics. Because war is a great motivator for human innovation, the tank began to appear towards the end of the war. It was very slow and clumsy but it was kind of used as a terror weapon, a psychological weapon, uh, and in World War II it will be the key piece in Hitler's blitzkrieg strategy. So in some ways you can think of World War I as a horrific game of whack-a-mole where each side hid underground and when they popped up they were fired upon. I made a joke. Pretty funny, right, Skeletor? You metal munching moron! Crude fundamental machine guns were used in the American Civil War, like the Gatling gun. 
During early part of World War I, generals were very unsure how useful and effective this weapon would be. But by the end of the war, it had made its mark. The first machine guns used during the war took a team of six to eight to operate. The guns would overheat heat easily, and they had to start using controlled bursts. Even though the machine gun was predominantly used as a defensive weapon, by the war's end, the consensus in the, on the battlefield was that a single machine gun was equivalent to at least 80 rifles. Field guns, or artillery, was the most used weapon of World War I. And though statistics are hard to come by, more people, it is argued, died from exploding shells and shrapnel than any other weapon of the war. As the war continued, the technology of artillery advanced. They became more accurate and more mobile. They also became bigger, bigger, and bigger. For example, the Paris gun, which was the largest artillery gun of the war, could shoot a 209-pound shell 75 miles away. At the Battle of Somme in 1916, 1 1.8 million shells were fired at the German lines in the span of a week. According to WorldWar1.com, the use of poisonous gas in warfare was deemed uncivilized. However, due to the prolonged stalemate of the war, armies on both sides grew desperate and gas was used. The use of gas had horrific consequences, tarnished the reputation of both sides, and had diminishing returns. Like the machine gun, the plane was a newcomer to the war scene and it wasn't very technologically advanced at the beginning of the war, but by the war's end it had proven its worth. And by the time we get to World War II, the plane will play a pivotal role. Skeletor, I wonder why the plane wasn't any good in World War I. Have any thoughts? Because you were a whip scientist and you could be a whip villain. Soldiers on both sides also experienced something called trench foot or immersion foot. It is a fungal infection caused by prolonged exposure to damp, cold environments. If trench foot was not uh, treated soon, gangrene would set in and the soldier's toes or foot would have to be amputated. So as you can see, the Great War turned out to be not so great. Uh, the soldiers had poor living conditions. The weather was horrible. You lived under constant threat of death. You had explosive shells coming over your head. If that didn't kill you, you were forced to charge into a barrage of machine gun fire. If that didn't kill you, the poisonous gas, which is a horrific death, uh, was coming your way, and if that didn't kill you, you got trench foot. <laughs> uh, why are you laughing, Skeletor? Uh, we are talking about a very serious subject. Millions of people died horrific deaths, and you're laughing? <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. What was I thinking? Skeletor as a motivational speaker? He's a master villain. He likes all this horrific death and destruction. I'm sorry. Skeletor, just get out of here. Get, go away. Get out of here. Out of my video. Oh, why do I surround myself with fools? Even the robots are smarter than you. On November 11th, 1918, an armistice was called and this romanticized ideal of war was finally discovered for what it is, a horrific human activity of death, 
suffering, and destruction. A new map of Europe was created where the nation of Poland was actually re-emitted into Europe. The Versailles Treaty heavily punished Germany for the responsibility of the war. Because of this, Germany's economy would suffer. Hitler would fan the flames of nationalism and blame the Versailles Treaty for Germany's woes. And World War II would be shortly on its way just a few decades later.